Hi, I'm, whoa. Um, I'm Robert Hammond. I'm one of the co-founders of Friends of the High Line. Um, thank you all for coming. This is in, uh, the second in a series. Um, this fall, we're going to have two more where we're going to talk about uh, the low line, which is right here in New York on September 10th. And we're going to have some uh, folks from New Orleans on October 15th working on some similar projects. And like we always do, we try to have music and food uh, that corresponds to the city. So I hope you all will um, stick around afterwards for um, more music um, that's been, been by Aaron Levinson, who specializes in rare and forgotten gems from across the uh, Americas and Caribbean Basin. And after this, we're going to have Detroit-style Coney dogs, hot dogs. I think it means hot dogs with chili and cheese. Is that, is that right? Okay. Um, so, and this talk is made possible by the New York Community Trust, uh, Lou Esther T. Mertz Advise Fund, in part with funds from the New York State Council on the Arts with support from Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Um, and I hope you'll join us for our other programs. We do about 400 free programs throughout the years um, for all ages. Um, later this week, um, one of my favorites, we're having salsa dancing. Um, right underneath the High Line. So I hope you'll come back for that. And if, if you're not signed up for our email newsletter or following us on Facebook, you'll, you'll know the drill for that. Um, so I want to give a, a brief bio of both of our uh, speakers. Um, Phil, Phil Cooley, who's going to speak first, um, he gave me an amazing tour of Detroit. Um, I guess it was last about last year. Um, he, um, he opened uh, Slow's uh, barbecue and slows to go with some friends and partners and because of the success of that he's been able to spend more time just helping and working with the residents of Detroit to sort of uh, do a lot of amazing project it was very inspiring um, going there it made me uh, you know think maybe that's that's the next city for me um, and then Faye Nelson um, is leading a massive restoration and permanent stewardship of the Detroit waterfront and I just saw in the newspaper you got some good news uh, today or yesterday that you can tell today, you can tell people about. Um, what will ultimately be um, a five and a half mile vision um, and the first uh, phase is, is, is coming through with three and a half miles and 80% complete. Um, and as she's won more, it, I, all the awards that you've won didn't even fit on this piece of paper. So, um, so again, thank you all for coming and look forward to hearing from you all. All right, well, hello everybody. Um, I'm Philip Cooley, and this is me 10 years ago standing in front of a building that I just bought. Um, so that is uh, Detroit, Michigan, and I moved to Detroit. I'd lived in Tokyo, Barcelona, London, Milan, and New York, and Chicago, all amazing cities. Um, but at the time, as a 24-year-old, I didn't really feel like I was able to participate in those cities um, with uh, a lack of financial capability and also a lack of a resume. So I moved to what I thought was probably one of the most democratic cities in the United States. Um, and this is where I could afford to participate. Um, so this, this building eventually became Slow's Barbecue. And I'm not really going to talk about Slow's all that much. Um, other than it's just been a catalyst. So I would have either um, worked probably for Ford Motor Company, which most of my family has, um, or Slows would be successful, which luckily it did. Met a great team of people we put together the restaurant. And since I can't manage a restaurant or make barbecue, um, I got to go out in the community and do fun work in the public. Um, so what we've always tried to do is just kind of reconsider um, the, the space, uh, Detroit, because you know, you're probably all very familiar with the Time Magazine image, the cover, talking about Detroit and the condition of Detroit. And it's not just Time Magazine, of course, it's many other folks. And so we started saying, okay, like such as these abandoned homes, obviously they do need to come down, but what are we going to do with them? Um, some will rebuild, others will have to recycle and reuse. And so that was kind of how we started playing with deconstruction. So you can see that's our patio. This is all reclaimed lumber from, from the landscape itself. So we're trying to see what are assets in, in our public space and how can we repurpose them. Um, the other thing is, is just kind of people as well. Um, you know, I think that 
But the folks in Detroit are incredibly talented, but ultimately aren't always able to participate. So we're trying to allow for as much participation as, um, as possible to be as democratic as possible. So uh, we all, we, we're able to kind of help other small businesses um, get open and you know, to, to you know, really create that ownership. So whether it's helping another, like this Le Petit Zonk, this cafe, we built their tables uh, for them, did their architectural drawings for free, did their, uh, pulled their permits for free, all those sorts of things. Um, and ultimately, we all benefit the community stronger around it. We can all bike to a great restaurant. Property values go up. Everyone's happy. We have a strong, connected, interwoven community. Um, also, when we're looking at uh, public space, um, which in a more traditional sense, we see just this tremendous um, importance to, to actually get the public out of their homes in you know, communicating and collaborating again. So this is a park across the street from Slow's Barbecue. And, very uh, underutilized is um, an understatement. So we started working in the park, and we've had over 1,000 volunteers join us. Uh, it's been five years, over $800,000. And remember, this is, these are very grassroots, small efforts. So the $800,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but it's been tremendous, um, the impact that it's had, and the ownership that the community has slowly taken um, because they've been participating in this whole process. And not just you know pulling the weeds and you know doing the heavy lifting, but also in kind of designing uh, the park and planning the park. Like, so we all feel that we're much smarter than we actually are. Um, and so we had all these grand ideas, but then we started talking to the community about them and quickly learned that everyone else had their own ideas as well. So instead of saying, well, this park is going to be this, this park is going to be this, since we had no budget, we said, let's just take this one project at a time. Um, let's, let's, let's obviously follow the city's um, guidance in terms of what their master planning for the park was, but let's allow the, the citizens to participate and evolve through this process. So um, the one thing that we knew, um, there's a, the city um, inside of it, we're in southwest Detroit, which is just south and west of downtown, uh, and in, in the, all the, the school kids there, we had about a thousand signatures in one, about one month worth of uh, outreach. Uh, from kids saying, we want a skate park. So we worked together with them. We worked together with different architects and designers in the community to come up with an idea that was wonderful for them, but also wonderful for BMX, wonderful for inline skating, wonderful for uh, what we call the blue hairs and the blue hairs. So like some kid with a, a mohawk could easily be seen skating it, uh, but also an uh, 80-year-old woman could be seeing, you know, reading the New York Times on it as well. So we want to be as inclusive as possible. So it's more of a plaza than an actual skate park. Um, I don't know why that photo is like that, sorry. But um, it, what you would see there, if that slide wasn't like that, was just the community coming out and really doing this. Uh, this is, it's been tremendous, the amount of hours that folks have put in, the amount of equipment. My neighbor gave us two front end loaders, uh, and, and I'd never driven this. So the, the front end loader is probably, I, you know, about the size of this, this screen up here, about out to here, massive, um, and I'd never driven one in my life. He gave me a five minute tutorial and delivered a second one and said, teach other people how to use it. So for two months straight, we were out there moving around Earth and making this happen. Um, and just, like I said, you know, hundreds of people on that project, thousands throughout. The other um, issue that we have, of course, you know, based on these abandoned buildings, there's a, there's kind of, folks in, in Detroit um, ultimately are adversely affected by the abandonment. So we want to start, you know, saying, well, what are, what are our possibilities? What are our options? So we started hosting these dining events in some of these spaces. And the idea is like, you know, very important to raise money. It's a charity, you know, we, it's a fundraiser for a charity always. It's very important to do that. It's always very important also to you know, get people together to have conversations in general, but doing them in these buildings, we're really redefining, because these buildings have become public space because they are a part of our community, and be, through the lack of ownership, we're actually having you know, to deal with these as a community, as a public together. And so let's start reimagining these and seeing them for their potential and possibility. And in, instead of saying, oh my God, this is, woe is me, there's this problem that we have that we'll never overcome. And so to go, uh, you know, to talk about this, so to give a, a concrete example, these are my neighbors. And these are owned by a billionaire. 
Um, so it's very difficult, of course, for most people to have access to these things. This, the billionaire that owns these specifically wants these buildings to look this way. There's a waiting list to move into our neighborhood so he could develop these, but he chooses not to because he uses this kind of landscape for his own purposes, for his own advancement. So going again back to how we, can we turn these buildings into public space, we decided to try this project. It's called Pony Ride. Uh, the bank called me and said, this building's 30,000 square feet. We want $100,000 for it. Would you like it? And so I got immediately excited because I needed a wood shop. And I also had been reading for eight years, and I was ready to buy a place. Well, I have a huge ego, but uh, not 30,000 square feet huge. So I only needed a small amount of the space. So what else would I do with the rest of the space? So we invited a, a bunch of smart people in, and they also said, like, oh, we should do this, uh, we, should, you know, we should do this, whatever they were passionate about, essentially. Again, they wanted it to be done there. So instead of saying, all right, this is a food place, and, and this we're going to carve this out, food, woodworking, metalsmith, we allowed the community to come in and say, well, I'm going to do this there. So as you can see up here, we've got Stukenborg uh, letter, letter Press. We've got um, you know, the Run Jit, which is an amazing hip hop dance crew. Um, little vessels, she makes boats. Um, so it, was, it wasn't very, you know, the collaborations between Veronica Scott and the Empowerment Plan and Detroit Denim is very obvious. One makes coats for the homeless, they become a sleeping bag that are sewn by the homeless. The other one makes the jeans that I'm wearing um, from uh, American Denim and they're handmade. So you could see how those people work together. But the collisions that are happening, because it's an honest, true community, are far more interesting when the letterpress hip-hop dance studio and boat makers start working together. So things that we would have never really imagined um, or, th or thought of are really you know, starting to flourish and blossom there because folks are, they are allowed access to this landscape that they traditionally wouldn't have. Um, because I bought the building so cheap, the rent there is about 10 cents to 25 cents a square foot, um, and that includes their utilities. So it's a subsidized process. And what makes that possible is, again, it's this volunteerism that's making this all possible. So not only did I get the building for cheap, but we've all just pitched in. So that's Veronica tearing down that wall with me. She's the head of the empowerment plan. Um, so you know, the, there's probably been about $150,000, which is, is close to 30% um, of our budget, um, actually just volunteer labor. So again, all that money goes to keeping that rent cheaper. And so the other thing that folks are asked to do um, because of the subsidized rent is, is work in the community because we believe in kind of that triple bottom line uh, business is, is really what's going to move Detroit forward. Is, you know, this, the idea of this community that's environmentally conscious, socially just, and fiscally sound. And so you can see examples of, of our community coming into our space, learning types at letterpress, learning fencing, learning dance, all these sorts of things. So, for me, it's, it's really about like what is public space. So um, in Detroit, we have a lot of kind of weird opportunities. And this is one of my favorite nights and favorite places to go watch um, some underground cinema and shoot some pool. And I, I don't know that I've ever been in a, a co-ed bathroom where people walk out of the stalls right directly to a bar and a, and a, and a, and a, and a pool table. But the point is, is that you know I think some of these traditional um, environments sometimes make us stagnant. And the the thing that's so exciting to me is that these strange possibilities are coming from. I think folks are, folks are being innovative because they're they're desperate and they're they need to do this. Uh, it's it's very it's a very different landscape. And and ultimately, because we have less resources, folks are doing this together. Um, they're, they're forced to work together um, and really create community. So thank you all, and here's Faye. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. My presentation actually begins with a video, which provides you uh, with the framework of what is happening on our Detroit riverfront. So I'll speak after the video. This beautiful international riverfront is representative of who we are as a community. 
I lived in another city right on their riverfront, and when I came back to Detroit, I wanted that same type of experience, somewhere that was centrally located that had access to the riverfront. The Detroit Riverfront Conservancy is a nonprofit organization. We were established in 2003 with a two-pronged mission. First and foremost, to develop the public space on the Detroit Riverfront, and as importantly, to serve as an anchor for economic development. When we came down uh, as General Motors in 1996, you did not see people walking baby carriages or walking their dogs or walking hand in hand along the riverfront. It's changed the way a lot of people experience the city of Detroit. It allows people to come together in a beautiful, safe, fun environment. I've got a group from church that after the 9.30 Sunday school hour, we'll go home and change into something and we will walk the river walk all the way down to Cobo Hall. We held community meetings listening very clearly to what it is the community was interested in as it related to their riverfront. I became involved with the Riverfront Conservancy at its inception several years ago because the, the riverfront is probably the most underused piece of real estate that we have in the city of Detroit. We are in the first phase, which is the East Riverfront three and a half miles from Joe Lewis Arena to just east of the Belle Isle Bridge. We're developing green space, all connected by the ever popular Riverwalk, which in essence is a greenway, a pathway that connects communities. And we had a tremendous opportunity with the Dequinder Cut, which had been essentially a negative asset uh, to a tremendous uh, positive one for the community. And it allows people now through the Lafayette Parks and all the way to, to uh, Eastern Market to access the riverfront. Greenways provide us an alternative to getting into the car or getting on a bus. I can get on my bike to take the DeGwinder Cut over to Eastern Market or I take the river walk from my home to downtown. We have all kinds of fantastic amenities, which include fountains and carousels. We have a cafe, bike shop, butterfly gardens, all on an international waterfront. The Conservancy is responsible for all the operations, the maintenance, the programming, the security, and as importantly, raising all the funds in order to support this effort. When we got started on this, I think it was important for all of us to recognize that we needed a entirely new approach. We needed a level of public-private partnership that, that probably hadn't existed before on a, on a project of this magnitude. The city has played a major role in supporting this effort with funds to support the future mixed-use development and preparing just infrastructure for the development of the project. The public and the private have come together in a way that's kind of unbelievable, quite frankly. I've never seen this kind of coordination before where people are working together and see what assets we as a city bring to the table and complement what the private industry bring to the table. General Motors put a tremendous amount of resources into this project, $25 million in the in the creation of the plaza and just terrific leadership throughout. It clearly it would not have happened without the Kresge Foundation. They put $50 million into this project. And they said, look, we're gonna help you get this done and we're gonna bring in other foundations and, and others to partner with you. And so it really could not have been done without them. At the end of the day, we wouldn't be where we are today, completing this three miles of developed waterfront, but for the community coming together and saying, you know what, this is our waterfront, and we are all going to come together in a variety of ways in the revitalization and the restoration of our riverfront. I do think that our conservancy can be a model for a lot of other cities, not just for their waterfront, but for uh, any activity where you need the public and the private to engage for the outcome of something very, very positive. Throughout the most challenging economic time, we're starting to see all kinds of new projects. We have the uh, Port Authority Terminal now, we have the new uh, Environmental High School, we have a, a lot of activity already taking place. While we are so proud about how far we've come, we really still have a ways to go. And a ways to go meaning more dollars, not only to construct, but to operate and to maintain and to program this public space. It really has changed the 
postcard image of the city of Detroit. It used to be that if you were in Windsor and you looked across the river, you would see some beat up old buildings and some abandoned cars. Now you look at it and you see the spectacular riverfront. You see millions of people coming down for the fireworks and for the marathon and for everything that's starting to take place on the riverfront. It begins to create this sense of destination. Riverfront is being a destination place. I have three kids, 10, seven, and five. The Riverwalk is one of their favorite places to go, no question about it. We take our bikes down there, we picnic down there, so it's this huge connector that we don't have to get into our car and drive down there and find a place to park. If we don't have families here in the city of Detroit, the city will never come back. So everything that we can do that's geared toward family and family fun, we need to continue to invest in that. This project has connected all these different communities in a way that I probably wouldn't have guessed. We have a vision of five and a half miles of riverfront that we're working to develop. We are in the midst of really the final phases of the first phase of our vision, which is the East Riverfront. The dream for the West Riverfront is very similar to the East in that we are looking to open up the waterfront to connect the public to the river. Right now on the West, even more so, there is almost zero access to the waterfront. I can't wait till the Riverfront West is complete so that we can have that connection to the East so that we can enjoy the water, the Riverfront, the walks with our family. Over the course of the next 10 or 20 years, the Riverfront is going to look entirely different and it is going to be really back to the future in a sense. 300 years ago when the city was founded, at the foot of Woodward, at the Detroit River, we're going to see the city re-blossom coming from that same geography. The riverfront gives you peace, it gives you pleasure, it gives you beauty. Everybody seems to be so happy when they're down here. The riverfront has showed us how great we can be. We can think big and we can do big things. Being able to look across the river and see another country and to enjoy the beauty of the river where it's open to everybody. Downtown is sort of like everybody's neighborhood. Thank you. So I've been asked to expand a bit more on this video to provide you with a sense of the depth of the of the development of the Detroit Riverfront. You have to know that for decades and decades, we had such a challenge with respect to the development of the Riverfront. We had tons of great plans, but they were always shelved. And so for many, many years, our Riverfront looked just like this. You know, abandoned buildings, burned out cars, weeded lots, and that was just the way it was. But, um, and so we had to live with this. Beautiful riverfront, terrible place in space. But in early 2003, as you heard on the video, the conservancy was created and we had a wonderful opportunity to travel throughout the country, some parts of the world, to bring back best practices as far as uh, the riverfront was concerned to assist us in developing a vision and a mission and also working with the community so that they could tell us, share with us what they were interested in seeing. We knew that, that this was an opportunity for us. It represented truly a once in a lifetime opportunity to really bring our riverfront back to life. And so to that extent, we developed that vision. You heard five and a half miles uh, going as far west as our bridge to Canada, to just east of our iconic Belle Isle Bridge, which is our bridge to our wonderful riverfront island. And so we're in the first phase of that vision, three and a half miles east riverfront, but we think about it in a little bit of a different way. 45 city blocks that we are almost close to completing. And this morning, we was really very pleased to announce two major grants for the Conservancy, one of which was a $28 million federal appropriation added to our 20% match. We've got about $32 million that we're gonna be able to use to complete our East Riverfront project. So we're very excited about that. As importantly, thank you so much. We're happy. And as importantly, as you heard on the video, we're responsible not only for construction, but for all of the operations and the maintenance and the programming of this public space and raising all the funds to support this effort. No subsidy, nothing other than all of our hard work. And so today we were also 
uh, very pleased to be able to receive a check for $15 million, which came from our conservation funded initiative, which is managed by the state of Michigan, which will support the sustainability of the conservancy. So it's a big deal for us, and we we're so very pleased to share uh, this moment with our mayor and with our governor and with our United States senator and everybody else that wanted to take credit for it. We loved them and because it was a great morning for us. <laughs> So anyway, but just to run through this real quick, we're a nonprofit organization, and we, um, when we launched this effort, it was really not a $300 million, it was a $500 million initiative. Because what you didn't hear on this video was that the city invested a ton of money in acquiring the silos and clearing the land and buying land and working with uh, other developers in order to prepare the riverfront actually for our development. So we were all worked really hard, we worked together, we knew that it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to revitalize our riverfront because it provided not only a wonderful opportunity to focus on the economics of what a developed riverfront would provide, but it was really like a social transformation, really bringing people together from throughout the region to enjoy our waterfront. So to that extent, I keep going the wrong way, um, it's a wonderful gathering place. And anecdotally, I will say to you that we, uh, we receive close to 3 million visitors annually to visit our, to experience our riverfront, and we haven't finished our development. And when I say anecdotally, we are now in the process of having an economic impact analysis conducted in order to really firmly connect the dots in terms of the value that this public space is already providing our community. But it's a great place. It's providing employers with a reason to locate and bring their employees down. Folks are coming down and moving to downtown Detroit. We've got young professionals that are so excited they cannot wait to experience uh, Detroit. And the riverfront really has served as a wonderful catalyst. Um, as I mentioned, we're the perpetual stewards of this space. And really, we would not be here without really an extraordinary public-private partnership launched by the city of Detroit, General Motors, you heard the Kresge Foundation, which still today, that $50 million challenge grant is the largest grant ever to a single project and really served as an economic catalyst to get us off and running. And from there, we were able to leverage all of those dollars to attract more funding to support our development efforts. Here's just a quick snapshot of the East River Front, which is that three and a half miles that I've referenced. And what I'd like to do is take really then a quick moment to do a bit of a deeper dive in terms of the massive nature of the development. What you see here is what we call the former Bates Street Wharf. It was in the 19th century. It had millions of visitors that were able to take sheen, uh, uh, steamships leisure and business travelers, but that to my left was the way the riverfront looked, not back in the 19th century, but really as early as the 2000s. And that was then, and this is the way it looks today. And that's the home of our brand new Port Authority terminal, and we're so excited because now we have a port presence, which we've really never had before, right on our waterfront. And so we're excited because this facility can now receive tall ships and large vessels and cruise ships. And up until now, our Canadian neighbors only had the capability, and now we have as well, so we're really excited. As you heard, General Motors, they moved in the late 90s to uh, move their headquarter operations to the riverfront. The majority of the riverfront was used as parking lots, and this is an example of what it looked like. So GM, when they moved down uh, through my board chair, Matt Cullen and a number of others, they were part of that group that got us organized and really moved forward with the vision of getting this riverfront developed, and this is the way it looks today. It's beautiful, it's a place where the community gathers all kinds of events and activities. It's where a lot of the community views the fireworks, fabulous fountains. And then here's another example of what our riverfront looked like. And that was, again, another parking lot. And so this is the way it looks today. That's our Rivard Plaza. It's a wonderful gathering place and space. And it's got all kinds of amenities, cafes, beautiful landscape. It's just a wonderful place. Um, we're very proud of our cafe. You can rent bikes on the riverfront. We're really excited about that. We've got all kinds of really inst um, um, instructional maps, a You Are Here map. There's a glass map that provides um, instructions on the waterway and how the, all of these pieces come together so we have a better understanding where these national and international freighters come from. 
Here's our Milligan State Park, the site of our Milligan State Park. This is the first state park in an urban community that is now located on our Detroit Riverfront. We're so proud, but up until the conservancy was created and this public-private partnership came together, the other part of our riverfront was used to, uh, for the home of cement silos. And we had huge piles of cement all up and down the riverfront. That was then, and this is the way it looks now. Fabulous harbor, wonderful place where we've got uh, trails and shoreline fishing, and there's a wetland demonstration for storm water. We've got boat slips and lovely little lighthouse that's uh, designed after northern Michigan. Here's where you probably would be interested, the Friends of the High Line. And this is, as you saw in the video, our, what we call our, our version of the High Line, or this is our Dequinder Cut. It was an old rail line that was abandoned since the early 80s. And it's now, thanks to the Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan and a number of other partners, it's been restored to a beautiful non-motorized trail. And here's some other pictures of the way. So this, this visual was actually taken in probably 2001. This is the way it looked. Here's another little creepy looking picture. And that was then, and this is the way it looks now. It's fabulous, we love it, it's popular, it connects the river to our farmer's market, as well as the surrounding community, creating that sense of walkability. Here are some other pictures that you see. It's a favorite place to have runs and walks and really bringing the community together. And we love what we call urban art, which is graffiti art. So we've actually hired artists to create graffiti murals in the Dequinder Cut. So it's a favorite place. One of the challenges that we had as we developed the riverfront, there was a lot of the riverfront that was eroded. It just didn't exist. You could walk out of this building, which has since been renovated, uh, and it's now the uh, lovely Riverwalk Hotel, and take two big steps and you'd be right in the river. So we worked with a number of agencies at the state and at the local level, and this is what we've been able to develop now, where you've got a beautiful public space to experience, and portions of the riverfront um, that there wasn't enough space, we actually cantilevered it out, and so we've got 20 feet over the Detroit River, so it provides for a very wonderful experience. A number of small park, pocket parks on the riverfront that we've been able to, uh, that we're managing now, and so um, this Mount Elliott Park will be uh, redeveloped. As a matter of fact, construction now has begun, and it's going to be have a lovely pavilion and plaza and a water-inspired park, which will be a universal play area, and it has all kinds of cool stuff um, uh, that's water-inspired, uh, water universally accessible. Then we have the most eastern end of our development, which is Gabriel Richard Park. And the picture you're seeing now is really when the right before we launched construction. It's real cleaned up, because before it was weeds and trash and all that good stuff. But this is the way it looks now, and this is what I call my Wizard of Oz shot, because it's so cool. And it has butterfly gardens and fishing piers and a, a labyrinth, and it's just a fabulous place. A lot of economic, develop economic development has now begun to spin off which is the other part of our mission, it, not only to connect the community to the waterfront, but really to serve as a catalyst. So we've got a new Riverwalk Hotel, as was mentioned in the video, a new math and science high school that um, uh, provides for 2,000 students. We've got the new port that opened just last year. We have a new senior riverfront community that is just gonna be fantastic. Our urban state park, which is going to be minimally 31 acres in footprint. They're now restoring a, historical, a building that's on the historical registry called the Globe Building, which is where Henry Ford did his early apprentice. And so they're gonna create this welcome and activity center that will be open year round. And then our Cobo Hall, our convention center, which is under a pretty major redevelopment, which will, uh, we believe, attract a lot more conventions from all over the country. And we're, this is where our North American Automotive Show is, is held. And we're excited because all of it will provide a beautiful uh, presentation, all glass encased, uh, southern exposure over the river, and a direct connect to the riverfront. So we have all kinds of events on the waterfront, concerts and marathon races. We have our annual summer festival, River Days, a lot of environmental programs. So it's just a wonderful, it's, it's, it's been great. And while it's been a challenge, I certainly wouldn't be remiss in saying it was easy. We're all very proud and so excited. We've raised, uh, as of today, a little bit over $120 million, which is our part of that three to $500 million launch. 
And we're continuing to move on. We're going to move west, and we're going to move to Phillips area on the, on the southwest side to complete our uh, riverfront development. But we are so proud, because I'm sure you don't hear, this is not the story you would hear about Detroit. We're so proud of our riverfront. We're so proud of our community that has come together, both on the public and private side, to support and create not only a wonderful quality of life today, but it will help significantly in the future of Detroit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Faye and Philip. That was fantastic. Um, we're going to take questions um, in just a second, but I just wanted to let you all know about a couple upcoming events at the Highline. I'm Danya Sherman. I do public programming and community engagement here. Um, this is part of a series, as Robert was talking about, about other adaptive reuse projects that are happening around the country um, and around the world. There are people in cities everywhere that are working really, really hard, as Faye and Philip are, to reclaim spaces and work with their governments and businesses to turn them into something for the public good. So we have a talk on September 10th about the Low Line, which is an abandoned um, underground trolley station on the Lower East Side that a couple of people have some grand plans for. Um, and we are going to do a talk on the Lafitte Corridor, um, which is an area in New Orleans, in central New Orleans, that is being revitalized as well, and that's going to be on October 15th. Um, and after our Q&A, we will have Coney Dogs for Sale, which is a special Detroit-style hot dog with chili and cheese and more tunes by um, Aaron Levinson. I also wanted to announce that next Monday we have a um, opportunity for you to get involved with the uh um, or sort of um, learn more and give us feedback and ask, answer quest or ask questions from the design team of the Highline. Um, the Highline's currently a mile long. The third section um, we're still working to develop, and next Monday, the 30th of July, right in this space at 6.30, the design team will be here to present their um, ideas for the design of the third section, so I definitely invite you all to come back and let us know what you think about that. Um, so questions for Faye and Philip. Hello, my name is uh, Michael Syfax, and I was, my question is, by me living in New York now, I'm from Detroit, I've been here since 2005, and I definitely have visions uh, to come back and like work with my city and doing stuff. How would you um, advise me to do that, living here, but, but still like trying to develop a business there? Is there any teams I can work with and things like that? Yeah, um, oh, okay, this thing's on, cool. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of resources, actually. Um, Dehive just opened up downtown, which is great. Um, kind of that's mentorship. Um, so in, in that kind of traditional way, like BizDemU and uh, Tech Town and things of that nature. But what I like is the informal network that exists there. Just a lot of people just saying, hey, how can we help you out? How can we work together to see you be successful? That you don't see in a lot of other places. So it's kind of you view each other as neighbors versus competition. So I would highly, you know, recommend that getting there. You know, I I moved back to Detroit. Also, I was reading Dave Hickey's Air Guitar, and like one of the Peter Schlendahl, I think that he quotes, who's a New York Times art critic, talked about you know, basically going to a city, meeting like-minded people at the bars, and and uh, creating a movement. Uh, and I so I literally took that, uh, I took that very literally, and, and just drank heavily for a year and a half there. So I don't know if I would do that uh, as much. But as you know, just getting out there, being social, it's an incredible network of people, and it's a very small town. Um, and it's once you're immersed in it, you'll I think you'll be very successful. Ab abandonment and population loss leveled off, or does it continue? Well, I mean, uh, Detroit remains very challenging in the sense that it has it, it has, among other things, an extraordinary financial that it's looking at right now. I mean, if I were to, if I were to describe Detroit, it's almost like a shell of Detroit. In one regard, we are, uh, there is a lot of, um, there's, there's been a lot of focus centering around bringing Detroit back uh, from a fiscal standpoint and directly connected with that, uh, bringing jobs back to the city. But that being said, there are a number of fresh new initiatives that really provide a snapshot into the future of a new Detroit. One example is what Philip is doing. We, we've got a, a, another example, a very vibrant midtown community that, where there's almost zero housing, 
that's available because it's been it's being snapped up so fast. We've got a very vibrant downtown area, all of it is pushing south to the river. So while we still have an extraordinary uh, number of challenges, I think that there's a, there are a lot of lessons that, are, that we're learning, you know, the, the first of which being that you just can't be that one trick pony, where all of our resources focused on the automotives, which essentially was the bread and butter in our community. But bringing our young professionals back, listening to some of what Philip is talking about, there are all kinds of uh, entities and opportunities for people to start their own businesses, really help to begin to diverse uh, the economics in Detroit. And so while we still have our challenges, jobs are still an issue, uh, I am firmly convinced that we're on the right road moving forward. Can you say a little bit more about the environmental and sustainable elements on the riverfront and maybe who some of the partners have been in that? Well, the environmental and the sustainability aspects of our development have been, have been huge. I mean, we have been working so fast to do so many things in such a short period of time to, uh, to be very candid. Raising the money and trying to develop a public space in which we, 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 we had a deliverable outcome. Uh, so now, as we continue to move forward in this development effort, we're able to take a step back and begin to focus on the critical areas that, that we believe will sustain the riverfront in the future, one of which is uh, our being good stewards from a, from a green perspective. So to that extent, we have put together, we're putting together a white paper that really will document all of what we're doing, not only from an administration standpoint, to a construction standpoint, and to an operation and maintenance standpoint. So for example, the, our new development, this next phase, which will allow us to complete the East Riverfront, has two very critical environmental uh, aspects to our construction. The first being our pavilion and plaza and that huge water feature uh, that's universally accessible. Uh, we have built it in such a way in which we will enable us to apply for LEED certification. We're also uh, on one of those pocket parks that right now, as beautiful as it is, remember my Wizard of Oz shot, there's no motorized access to the park, believe it or not. So we're going to be building a very green friendly park that will, parking lot that will serve as a dual uh, rain garden type of effect which will be able to naturally irrigate the surrounding vegetation. So that's just an example of, of what we're doing, but what we wanna be is very strategic and how we had addressed the, this whole conservation green environmental focus. And so we've got some experts that are working with us to help us not only capture all of what we've done in terms of, for example, how often we water our lawns to what type of substance we use to fertilize uh, the green space. But we want to be able to capture this in such a way that we're not only capturing what we've done, what we've done, what we're doing, the direction where we're headed so that we really have a sustainable strategic program. A question, a question for both of you. Uh, have you found that through what you're doing with open space, you talked a little bit about it in the film, but are, are you seeing an increased amount of um, uh, pedestrian and bicycle traffic versus um, motor traffic, which of course, you know, the capital of the uh, motor industry? Go ahead that on the riverfront we are seeing it increase so much that we're going to have to put more signage up. There are so many people that are down and really discovering the riverfront. So again, up until the early 2000s, there was no access. There was no access. So if you rode bikes, if you were a runner or walker, you just didn't have an opportunity to, there was no real safe, contiguous, I would say, pathway if you wanted to connect to the river. And now there is. And so what we're doing is we are expanding not only the riverfront east and west, but now north-south, that Dequinder Cut, that you know, restored rail line, will eventually provide for a connection to our midtown area going sort of northwest. So I expect, anticipate within a five-year time frame, we will have probably close to 25 to 26 miles of greenway that will encourage those walkers, that will encourage that bike traffic, because you'll be able to come from Midtown to our urban farmer's market, uh, down to the river by way of the Dequinder Cut, and depending upon which way you go, you can go east and, cir and circle the, uh, the island that I described, but really encouraging 
that sense of walkability, that sense of healthier lifestyle, that sense of community that we are seeing in a major, major way. And also the, um, yeah, for us in our neighborhood, I mean, you saw the, the shot, so there wasn't a whole lot of any type of traffic on that block. Um, but every, every business is, you know, their bike racks are overflowing, they're locking the trees, they're locking to um, lampposts, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible to watch um, you know, the, the greenways outside of the riverfront that are all connecting throughout the city. Um, the last five years has been an explosion, so it's, it's great to see. Talk a little bit more about the public-private partnership and how you encouraged private development. Well, the uh, public-private partnership which was established, which really served as a launching point for the Conservancy, was something that was a, it was a real new paradigm in terms of how we did business in Detroit. I mean, Detroit, as I'm sure you all know, has, has been, it, it's, it's a very separated uh, community. You have uh, we have got the suburbs, and, that, and we have the city, and, and oftentimes the burbs aren't connecting well with the city and vice versa, and so how do you bring a community together to work together for the purpose of not only revitalization but sustainability? Also, uh, it was clear that we had to figure out as a community uh, how do we develop, how do we do something different because clearly cities counties, they were, just did not have the wherewithal to build what they built, you know, decades before. So that being said, we realized that in order to be able to build our riverfront, we had to come together and work together. And so that public-private partnership, which was really so critical, not only in terms of the contribution, but symbolic, City of Detroit, General Motors, and the Kresge Foundation really served as a model on how we can work together a model of common interest. We were able to demonstrate that we could work together to make something happen. And so it's been, there have been a very, a number of variations of public-private partnerships really before the Conservancy was created. One that comes to mind is the Super Bowl. We brought the Super Bowl to Detroit and really the entire community worked together to create a wonderful experience. Two other initiatives that are taking place right now and it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not been easy. I mean, we've got the corporate sector that, of course, knows how to do everything just perfect. And the our government sector that, of course, is not bureau bureaucratic and can do everything perfect as well. My job, if you can give me a little bit of sympathy, is keeping all the puppies in the sandbox and moving the process forward, among other things. But it's working, and we're very proud of it. And today's announcement was an example of how Republicans and Democrats, uh, private as well as public, uh, our foundation community have all come together to support the continued development of the riverfront. So we're very proud of that. Uh, ours is a little different um, because it's less dollars based and more, um, you know, sweat equity and volunteerism. So for us, it's it's really been about activating the community because we know we know the park is. I mean, it's been the, most of the parks are threatened to close down in Detroit, so the community finally just says, well, we're going to do this ourselves. We still need our public space. And so when, it, when, when the community is pushed far enough, then they activate, and it's incredible what happens um, when, when they take ownership, when it's truly theirs. So that's been, the, that's been the most exciting thing for me, is watching on a smaller scale, when, when ownership is honest, um, to watch the innovation that, that folks that are traditionally viewed as, um, you know, not capable or are just excelling and doing things um, far, I think, far greater than what we would traditionally expect, I guess. I think what's so incredible is the passion that Detroiters have for their community. I mean, we love our city, and we're working hard to bring it back, all of us. Hi, is a question more for Philip. Um, I've been to Slows several times, and I'm, I'll be there several more times. Awesome. Fantastic. Cheers. Um, we haven't heard a lot about the uh, community gardening or urban farming phenomenon yeah. in the city, and I'm wondering, you know, you've talked a lot about how you're developing small businesses, incubated businesses. Have you reached out to that community as well, and, and what do you yeah. see there in the future? 
Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's an amazing part of our landscape, and it's, it's one of the many uh, facets I think that will bring Detroit forward uh, on multiple levels. Sometimes it's just about community engagement and just getting people active in their community um, on a small scale. Sometimes it's actually about food production, providing food for our, our, our Eastern market or providing food for restaurants. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's incredible. I, I've been fortunate to work with a few different farmers. My bobcat um, just got back to me with quite a bit of maintenance on it. Myself, now I'm, I'm like the guy who gave me the front end loader. I got my little tiny bobcat. And um, yeah, the woman making Detroit dirt, which is uh, zoo poop, um, coffee grains, and, and brew waste, brewery waste, spent grain, um, you know, just had been using it for the last year, making compost and wore out the tires and, uh, you know, needed, needed some grease and some, a little bit of maintenance. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's been incredible to, try to participate in any way that we can in that world. Since I am in the restaurant industry, we really believe in, in food and connection to the kind of the, that, that built environment to be uh, a catalyst for moving forward. So it, there's, there's other farmers beyond that as well that we all, we all work together. I mean, it's, they help me out just as much as I help them out as well. So. Okay. Right. Well, let, let me just say just a couple of things. One is that I don't have the exact answer to your question other than to say that the, all of our development is handicap accessible um, and that we, will, we work and continue to work in order to be responsive to all of our community. And I'd be happy to talk to you separately about this afterwards. But, but if I could quickly return to a question that was asked, and I think it dealt with the, the, the future mixed use of this public space, and that really is our next step. We are the riverfront and our development, our focus is not only on connecting the community to the waterfront, providing them for the first time in many, many decades with uh, access to the riverfront, but really working with our public-private partners to serve as a catalyst for that economic development. And so there are a number of developments that are already in play. We're looking forward to, that really is the next step, to identify places and spaces where we, we look to attract residential as well as retail to, uh, to the waterfront. So that's, our, that's the next step, I think, in the process. I mean, we've been able to demonstrate that we can develop, that we can uh, provide a terrific return on investment, and we'll continue to work to create a vibrant riverfront. Any other final words, Faye and Philip? Well, I, I just want to take a moment to thank you, Danya, and thank the Friends of Highline for inviting me to uh, present. It's a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to speak about what really is near and dear to my heart as a native Detroiter, and that's returning, uh, bringing our community back. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Faye and Philip, once again, and stick around for hot dogs and more music.